Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Huntsman. Uh, today we'll go through a presentation we recently had at our office going through the proposed student loan changes as well as a brief history and how to plan for student loans as well. So with that, uh, again, my name is Lauren Huntsman. I'm a certified financial planner, certified student loan professional, and tax professional and planner here at WealthNest. Uh, big reason I got into the student loan certification and education is just because student loan repayment is such a different type of repayment structure in terms of debt compared to a lot of other debt out there. Uh, and with the long, long uh, repayment structure, uh, having a plan ahead of time can save you a lot of headache and money down the line. So with that, a couple topics we'll cover today. Uh, first topic being student loans and how we got here. We'll then go through the proposed student loan changes. Uh, also the economic effect of those proposed changes. And finally, and most importantly, planning for the future of student loans. So section one, student loans and how the heck we got here. Uh, so a brief plug before we get into the, the history here, I did about a, a 20 minute uh, history diving into how student loans came to be and how they became to be such a problem that they are today. Uh, so feel free, we have a video on our website and app if you're interested in that. Uh, but with that, we'll go through just a brief timeline here through the decades. So starting in the 1940s and even before in the 1940s, uh, college was for the elite. Only about 600,000 uh, folks were enrolled in 1919. But bringing us to uh, 1994 and after World War II, the GI Bill was passed. And the GI Bill allowed federal grants for returning soldiers, which eventually uh, sent about 8 million soldiers to college. So this was a big deal, really spurred uh, the movement into the college sector. Uh, then moving into the 50s, in 1958, the Cold War brought fear that the U.S. was falling behind, especially with the Soviet launch of Sputnik. So with that, Congress passed the National Defense and Education Act, which offered scholarships and loans uh, for folks to really get into the scientific and technical fields. Uh, so then going into the 1960s, higher education offered grants to students based on income. And this was huge and dramatically changed the landscape uh, because this helped women and minorities go to college, which again, created a greater pool of folks uh, able to go to college. Then scooting into the 1970s, and if this sounds familiar, let me know. Uh, inflation soared, the economy stagnated, economic inequality increased, and tuition rates skyrocketed. Uh, America at this time really got into the, the game of price equaling quality, where uh, colleges were able to raise their price, say, hey, we're a greater school, we provide a greater education, uh, and we got kind of stuck in that game, which wasn't necessarily true. Then going ahead in the 1980s, we run into the Reagan era uh, and the tax revolt, where we had to pass tax and expenditure limitation, where student aid was the most affected and slashed by 25%. Uh, and this set a big precedent where politicians realized, hey, uh, we don't have to raise taxes as much, or even if at all. Uh, people and voters more so uh, would prefer that programs were cut than rather taxes were increased. Uh, so another important point to remember at this time is that schools were heavily subsidized by states. And so because that uh, programs were cut, that states had reduced subsidies and college costs, again, boomed. Okay, then going through to the 1990s, more amendments uh, were passed that allowed for unsubsidized loans regardless of financial uh, need. This created FAFSA and pilot income-based repayment plans, which will really become a big cornerstone in how student loan repayment is today. So we'll touch base on that. And then going ahead in the 2000s, uh, President George W. Bush passed the Higher Education Act. And this created PLUS loans, which allowed borrowers to borrow up to the whole cost of attendance. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a huge precedent that was Senate where you know colleges don't have any skim in the game that government will foot the bill every time. They can keep increasing costs. Uh, and so again, colleges have no skin in the game and can keep raising costs for uh, borrowers. Okay, so this brings us to the Great Recession of 2008. And you'll see that state funding since 2008 for higher education has fallen more than seven billion since 2008. Uh, and again, with everything that happened in 2008, state funding was further crushed uh, and because of this, you'll see that four-year public college tuition increased by 36% from 2008 to 2018. Uh, and even bigger, you'll see down below, since 1987, the cost of college has risen by nearly 500%. Uh, just some insane numbers. So to put that 
in uh, a little more context, you'll see we have two graphs here. So on the left-hand side, I believe Arizona is the fourth from the top. Uh, this is the de decrease in state funding uh, per borrower uh, at each state. So you'll see I will round it up for Arizona, about 3700 bucks less paid per student uh, since 2008. And then on the right-hand side, again, not good company to be in. I think, believe Arizona is second from the top. You'll see that this is the rate of tuition that has increased at public colleges. I believe Arizona is at 92.4%. So just some staggering numbers where uh, programs, funding for them have been cut. And again, schools are not on the hook. They can keep raising tuition to cover costs. So in summation, kind of the big reasons why student loans cost so much now. There's been this large increase in demand, largely uh, spurred by the government, a decrease in state funding higher operating costs that the colleges have passed on to borrowers, and again, more access to credit where uh, the government keeps producing programs that will cover the cost of college, where colleges aren't responsible for lowering their costs at all. Okay, so section two, uh, and what, what's mostly in the news now, is the proposed student loan plan uh, by the current administration. So we'll get into that here. So there's been three big changes. Uh, the first change, most notable that you've seen in the news, is this 10,000 and 20,000 of forgiveness. So with this, uh, it's important to note that you have to be a qualifying federal student loan borrower. And what that means is you have to have federal student loans. So if you have private loans, this won't affect you. Uh, you have to have federal student loans. So if you have federal student loans, you have the option to have uh, up to 10,000 forgiven off your current balance. And if you're a Pell Grant recipient, uh, the option to have up to 20000 for giving off your current balance. And a Pell Grant recipient, so Pell Grants are given on a needs-based uh, basis. So you can check on mystudentate.gov, uh, but if you received a Pell Grant, it's needs-based. And so with that, you can have up to 20000 for giving off. Uh, now the stipulations and limitations with this it is based on your income. So more details will come out in October, but as of right now, uh, they're saying up, if you are a single tax filer, if you make 125,000 and less, uh, you should qualify you for either that 10 or 20,000 off. And then the same deal if you're married finally jointly for families, you make up to $250,000 uh, and, and have those amounts uh, forgiven. So we'll get more into the details on that, but that's the first change there. Okay. Second change uh, is the payment pause is extended. So this one's pretty simple. Again, if you've had federal student loans, you'll know that uh, with COVID, they've paused uh, any repayments since March of 2020. It's been extended uh, a couple times throughout these past couple years, and most notably was supposed to be resuming on September 1st of this year of 2022, but they have extended it one final time through the end of the year, December 31st, and we can expect repayment back in the beginning of January 2023. So again, no payments will be required during this time. It will be the final extension, uh, and more details will come out, uh, especially with loan servicers, uh, uh, when exactly the will be due, but expect the beginning of 2023. Okay, here is the third change, and honestly the most notable, but not being talked about uh, much in the media, so we'll get into this. Um, but some big changes in, in facts of uh, income-based repayment plans. So income-based repayment plans are exactly how they sound. Uh, instead of having you know, a loan amount and your payment being based off the loan amount, your payment is based off your income. So if your income changes year over year, your student loan monthly payment will change year over year as well. So we'll get more into the details on that, but here's some key facts that are proposing to uh, change on these income-based repayment plans. So an income-based repayment plan, they are proposing to lower the student loan payment cap from 10% of your income down to 5%. So we'll go through uh, an example here. Uh, but they're also proposing to relay, uh, raise the excluded income calculation from 150% over the poverty line to 225% over the poverty line. So also another big deal where uh, more of your income is excluded. They're raising the, in, or excuse me, lowering the income cap. Uh, so lower student loan payments coming with that. On top of that, uh, one big thing in these income-based repayment plans, because your payment's based on your income and not necessarily your loan amount, a lot of folks have run into issues where with their loan balance is increasing because they're not even going into their uh, interest. But the government says, hey, as long as you're making your monthly payment, we'll cover any unpaid monthly interest. So that would be a huge deal if that goes through. 
Um, also, they're all looking to lower the um, loan term from down, down from 20 years down to 10 years. So that would be huge, cutting the loan terms in half. Um, and so a, a big point, and it hasn't gotten much media attention as well, is the rescue plan of 2021. So when that happened in 2021, the Biden administration said, hey, uh, with making these income-based repayment plan, monthly payments, at the end of your loan term, whatever you've had at the end, if you didn't get pay your whole loan amount, that's usually a taxable event. And we'll go through an example. But in 2021, they passed, if your loan uh, term was ending by the end of 2025, you wouldn't have to worry about a tax bill of what's forgiven. So we'll get into that. And, you know, questions are, will they extend that? Who knows? We'll get into a, an example here and, and go through the facts. Okay. So before we get into the example, just wanted to show everyone what these income-based repayment plans, what you might see. Um, and so all of these have been executive orders. So you'll see, I believe there's five different repayment plans out there now. With all the new proposed changes with the income-based repayment plans, I'm not sure if they'll consolidate it down to one or what those will be. But just so you're aware, the biggest three are the new IBR, the payee, and the repayee. And really the only differences are the, in those are the loan repayment terms and how much income is uh, calculated for your monthly payment. So just so you're aware, uh, those are the income-based repayment plans available. And now, going to everyone's two favorite things, taxes and student loans. Uh, wanted to bring your attention, I know it be, might be a little small on the screen, on line 11, uh, your adjusted gross income. Now this is the, uh, the item they look at in calculating your student loan payment. So it's important because of two things. So if that adjusted gross income uh, is that number that they calculate, the question is, hey, with wages, you know, capital gains, any income sources, all that adds to your adjusted gross income. So are there ways to lower your adjusted gross income to one, reduce your monthly student loan payment, but also two, lower your tax bill at the end of the year? So I'm glad you asked. A couple strategies you can use to reduce your adjusted gross income. So first and easiest strategy I give to a lot of my clients is making traditional 401k contributions. So I tell folks to give the example, let's say you make $100,000 in the year. If you put $10,000 of your uh, wages into a traditional 401k, if you deferred that, then instead of having 100,000 on line one for your wages, it would be 90,000. So that's an easy way to lower your taxable income, lower your adjusted gross income, uh, while also contributing to your financial goals and paying less to the government. Uh, another way are traditional IRA contributions, and I will scoot back to the previous slide to show you. Um, this is where you have adjustments right before adjusted gross income. So based on your income, you can make a traditional IRA contribution up to $6,000, uh, and you can have $6,000 taken off your uh, income and lowering your adjusted gross income. So again, another way that you can save towards retirement, lower your adjusted gross income, and pay a little less come tax time. Okay. And finally, uh, implementing some tax-efficient strategies in your non-qualified investment accounts. So these are accounts, they're not 401ks, not retirement accounts, uh, might be just simple brokerage accounts where you really have to look at and make sure that you're not incurring any capital gains, short-term capital gains, so those are tax ordinary income rates. Uh, you wanna make sure that you are uh, implementing some tax efficient strategies so you're not having uh, money and that's not necessarily going to your pocket being counted towards your adjusted gross income. Uh, so again, that's something I do here with all my clients as well. And one, lowering your tax bill, making sure uh, your financial accounts are working in a tax efficient manner. And so it's not affecting your student loan payment. Um, so three very easy strategies help reduce your adjusted gross income on a year over year basis. Okay. Now, we've talked about the three big changes they're proposing. What are the economic effects of this proposed plan? Well, a couple numbers here for you. So the Biden administration has come out and saying, hey, these three changes, we're expecting this to cost $240 billion. Now, the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget is saying, hey, we're thinking more closer to 400 to 600 billion. Now, Wharton has come out with uh, their own independent estimate, and they said, hey, guys, we're thinking closer to 1 trillion. So how do we have this big discrepancy, and how do we get from 240 billion to 1 trillion? Well, I'll show you here. Um, here's an excerpt from Wharton's study. You can find it online as well. It kind of breaks down those three big changes we talked about. 
Uh, and you'll see uh, loan forgiveness, loan forbearance, and the new IDR, so that's Income Driven Repayment, Income Based Repayment Program. And that Income Based and Income Driven Repayment Program, that is the biggest question mark, because as you'll see in the little asterisks there, that's only based off of people that are in the Income Driven or Income Based Repayment Plans right now. With all the proposed changes they, they've said, I can't think of many reasons or it'd be very few where you would not opt into that income-based repayment program. So we expect, expect a flood of new people going into that income-based repayment program, which I think will get that number easily up to that total number of one, $1 trillion. Um, so we'll see as these months go out and what actually gets through, what that number comes to be. Um, but we do expect it to be a very large expenditure, more than the administration uh, is uh, projecting right now. Okay. So again, in summation, kind of the reasons why uh, is we think that income-driven repayment, the income-based repayment, and limiting your future debt payments uh, is the biggest reason why this is going to cost such a large amount. So for example, you know, let's think of a borrower who's making $70,000. Um, they would be limited to paying 20,000 or excuse me, 2,000 bucks a year. And reason why is you take 70,000 and now with the new poverty line being about uh, 30,000, that you take the 70,000, subtract the 30,000, only 40,000 of their income is uh, included in the income based repayment uh, calculation. So if we take 40,000, uh, divide that by 12 and multiply that by the 5% income cap, the most that someone paying seventy thousand a year, uh, or making seventy thousand a year, they're going to be uh, limited to only paying two thousand dollars a year. So this is incentive for borrowers to take out loans greater than what they actually need. They can go to any college they want if you're expected to make the same amount coming out. Uh, so they say, hey, my income is going to be capped. Uh, my student loan payment is going to be capped. So taking out a larger loan doesn't really affect me in the long run. And again, colleges, it's the same old story. They can charge whatever they want and still get huge checks from the government. Uh, so we're not yet addressing the root of the problem. So just some food for thought there. Um, and hopefully we come to a solution actually fixing student loans. Okay. And so with these proposed changes, do we think they're going to be implemented fully? Uh, the jury's still out on this. We don't know. Um, if they do, we do expect college costs to skyrocket, mainly because of the same things we've talked about. Colleges have no incentive to reduce their costs, rather to increase their costs, um, and they have yet to be uh, held accountable for their increase uh, in college costs because the government picks up the bill. Okay, going to our fourth and final and honestly most important section is planning for the future of student loans and how we avoid this debt trap and maximize our financial goals at the same time. So why this is so important, why planning for student loans is so important, just some figures uh, about student loans today. Uh, with borrowers today, about 50% have delayed contributions to their retirement account, about 40% have delayed buying a home, about 19% have postponed expanding their family, having kids, and not only are these just huge cornerstones for individual happiness and success, but this has real economic output as well in terms of a declining birth rate, folks not being able to afford houses, uh, just some real uh, tangible effects that student loans are having uh, on everyday folks. So the first uh, way to plan towards student loans, especially for you know, parents or grandparents that expect, you know, hey, my kids are going to go the college route or have some sort of higher education, are these 529 plans. And they're called 529 plans, uh, they're part of the tax code. And basically what these are are investment accounts that offer tax benefits and they're used to pay for qualified education expenses. Uh, so I tell people to kind of think of this like a Roth account where this is after tax money you're getting in your pocket, you're depositing it into an investment account, it's able to uh, grow tax free, so there's tax deferral, and as long as you take it out for qualified education expenses, so that's uh, tuition, room and board, books, computers, as long as you take it out for qualified education expenses, uh, it's tax free. So super powerful tax tool uh, where, again, after-tax contribution on a tax-deferred basis, withdraw it tax-free. And then in Arizona specifically, for folks who uh, make contributions to a beneficiary's 529 plan, you get a $2,000 deduction on your state taxes per beneficiary. So if you're married finally jointly, if you contribute $4,000, get up to $4,000 per beneficiary. Um, so it's super powerful for folks who are contributing as well and also for the beneficiary at the end of the day. Um, they've made some recent changes as well, 
where they've expanded the use for 529 plans. So you can now use it for, you know, K through 12, for some private schools, and I believe even um, uh, some, uh, if you're not going to college, uh, any of the other careers, if you're doing some type of internship, uh, something like that, they can be used for that as well. Uh, another portability they've added is for folks who have 529 plans. They don't use the full amount for college. They can use up to $10,000 for their own uh, student loans remaining afterwards. So super powerful tool, uh, gives you some tax benefits, especially in Arizona on both sides. Okay. So another uh, good planning aspect is uh, having borrowers do their due diligence. So it may seem uh, like common sense a little bit, but if you do have some kids or grandkids who are getting close uh, to applying for college, really having those conversations and sitting down with kids, you know, thinking about, you know, their goals beyond and outside of their college years. So I know when I was in uh, high school, we had this business elective class where we had to go on, I believe, the National Bureau of Labor Statistics, you look up, hey, this is what I want to do. Um, so you get, you know, the pay and what state you wanted to live in, the cost of living. Think about all the other goals you had outside of college. And it really puts into perspective, hey, is going to an out-of-state college worth it for what I'm going to be paying? So it really makes them think on, okay, what's most important to me now and also in the future. Uh, so again, uh, it makes them look at their indus industry viability and pay, uh, along with, too, hey, evaluating in-state versus out-of-state costs. Do you go to community college, especially if you're going out of state to gain in-state residency to reduce your college costs? Um, just all important things to consider. Uh, and one thing we saw, especially in 2008, with folks going back to get master's degree, uh, make sure it's worth the cost. Sometimes kids will get out of school, they don't know exactly what they want to do yet, and so they go back into school, gain more student debt, and maybe it's not worth what they're actually going to be going into. So really weighing, hey, is this worth the cost? And again, evaluating trade schools. Uh, as we've seen through the history, the government's really pushed uh, college education, uh, but there's also a lot of great trades out there where you can go in debt-free, make good money, maybe even own your own business. So evaluating all your options out there. And then further on that, uh, in needing to do your due diligence, believe it or not, the education industry and colleges do not have your best interests in mind. I had this story uh, of a parent who mentioned that uh, their kid, they were going through the application process and going through their own portal only that they can access. And they had to, they went through and they had to automatically opt out of a $2,500 uh, unsubsidized federal loan uh, for each semester. So you're telling an 18-year-old year, kid to read the fine print and opt out of $2,500 uh, semester uh, student loan. Just insane. So there's no disclosures given for the amount that students are taking on, especially fresh 18-year-olds. Uh, I always tell people to think of, you know, the mortgage process, the mortgage lending standards that are out there. You're not just able to opt out, uh, you know, uncheck a box, make your signature, and have this huge amount of debt. Uh, there's a lot better practices and standards in place, and I hope we get to that point where they have that. So just being aware and making sure, making your kids aware, and if you're able to be there uh, with them in that process, very important. Okay. And also another thing out there is this bar defense student loan forgiveness. So this administration has actually forgiven the most amount of uh, student loan debt. And currently there's over 155 schools and colleges that potentially qualify for forgiveness under settlements. So this is whether uh, universities misled folks, if they close, um, all different reasons. And I just want to point out, especially in Arizona, there are three colleges currently underway in this. So it's University of Phoenix, Grand Canyon University, and Arizona Summit Law School. So something worthwhile if you have student loans, seeing if any of the schools that you attended are on this list and potentially having forgiveness due to uh, whatever practices they had in place. Okay, so again, going back to income-based repayment, planning for this tax bomb. So we talked about, hey, there's one way we need to manage current year's taxes. So again, income-based repayment is based off your current year's uh, adjusted gross income. But at the end of that loan repayment term, because the student loan payment is not based on the loan amount, it's based on your income, if there's any balance at the end, it's forgiven. But what that means is it's a one-time taxable event. So we'll go through an example here, kind of show you how that works. So uh, let's pretend uh, I myself, a single filer, I have $50,000 on my student loan balance remaining at the end of my 10-year repayment. 
uh, let's pretend to make $100,000 of W-2 wages. And because I have this $50,000 left over as my balance, I get a $50,000 tax form issued to me, uh, taxed as ordinary income. So what does that look like on the tax return? So I'll show you here. We'll kind of walk through it. So again, line one, this is my taxable W-2 wages. Uh, as I mentioned, you could make 401k contributions that would reduce your taxable income. But for simplicity, let's just pretend I didn't do that for this year. So $100,000 of taxable income. Uh, you'll see right down below in other income, that's that $50,000 tax form. So although I didn't receive $50,000, they forgave the $50,000 I had left over. So they are taxing me on that debt forgiveness. So we add the 100,000, we add the 50,000, that gets us to 150,000 of total income. Again, I'm a single filer, let's assume I take the standard deduction. So that gets my taxable income at 137,450. If we take the tax on that, before any withholding, taxes due on that would be 23,997. So just about 24,000. Uh, and to put that in perspective, if you took that 50,000 out of there, you'd be looking closer to 14, 15,000 bucks in taxes. So that's about nine grand difference in taxes that you definitely want to uh, prepare for and plan for because uh, that's a big change for the year prior. So again, this is just showing, hey, the impact that this tax bomb can have uh, with proper planning. Again, making traditional 401k contributions. Maybe you're maxing out your 401k that year. Uh, there's ways to thoroughly uh, reduce this taxable amount. So that's how that works. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, this is what I help a lot of my tax clients with, prepare for. Uh, and plan when that day comes. Okay, so now for folks where if you're like, hey, you know, I'm going to school to be a doctor, a veterinarian, a lawyer, whatever it may be, where, you know, you know you'll have to take out student loans based on the amount of schooling and the price of schooling and what that is, um, there's something called public student loan forgiveness. Uh, so what this is, is you have a couple requirements you have to make, which one of them being in the income-based repayment plan. And with that, instead of having a taxable bomb at the uh, end of your loan repayment, it's completely wiped out. So doing this, you have to have direct loans. Uh, you must work full time. For employment, and this is usually the biggest one, is being employed by US federal government, state, local, or tribal government, or nonprofit. So that's like a 5013C organization. Being employed by one of those full time, you're an income-based repayment plan and you have to make 120 qualifying payments, and usually what that amounts to is 10 years of those 12 payments per year. So if you hit all of those at the end, no matter what your balance is at the end, totally forgiven, you don't have to worry about a tax bomb at all. Um, so super powerful uh, and a great tool they have for those folks who need to take out a lot of student loans. Maybe this is an avenue you explore uh, to not have to worry about this tax bomb at the end. Okay. So a couple of resources for everyone, um, one being federalstudentaid.gov. Uh, this is where you apply for aid. You can get all the up-to-date info on your loans and also applying for PSLF. Um, so super important, you can go online, to find all that information on there. Then further, we have our app, the Wealthness app. Feel free to download that. Uh, it has presentations like this, videos, blogs, articles, timely information, student loans, financial topics, and tax topics as well. Um, so feel free to connect with us that way on that. And then if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out uh, via email or call our office. More than happy to connect uh, on a time that works best to go over any questions you may have. And uh, with that, that is all the proposed changes and planning we have at this time.